Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. Ephesians chapter 2. As we continue our series on God and the family. God and the family. And I titled this, Above All. Above All. Above All. Above All. Let me request for my 45 minutes. Let this start counting now. That one is a pep talk. I think you have to adjust that on your place. Don't put me under pressure. There are many things in my heart this morning, but just give me my required 45 minutes. Praise God. Above all, Ephesians chapter 2. We read the first 10 verses. And you, he made alive, who are dead in trespasses of, and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the hair, the spirit who now walks in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of the wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up together and made us to see together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding greatness of his the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Our test this morning, I will expand it later, but it has a whole lot to do with the topic I'm addressing this morning. There is a concept in marital um, cycle or studies among um, people who are married, how the concept of the family of origin played a very significant role in either the success or failure of their marital relationship. And so I want to address it because it's, um, for me, a lot of the time when we talk, I have preached on marriages for some time, but when we talk most of the time, it has to do with uh, what you need to do to spice up your marriages. And that is okay. But i rather deal with the roots. Uh, because um, if you are not happy uh, as an air hostess, no matter how you smile at people, it just doesn't work. There will be an error of judgment along the way. So, for me, there are certain things that uh, we don't have to break our heads on. It's just coming into the awareness. There are certain things that when we have the understanding, just like Jesus or God himself says, he said, my people, my own people, they are destroyed, not because of the devil, but they are destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. In Proverbs 19, 2, it said, For a soul to be without knowledge, it is not good. It's not good. It's not good. So, this is just to help us. And you probably, as I speak this morning, you notice certain things. So, whether you are married, or whether you are still single, preparing to get married, or whether you have given marriage a shot at one time and things didn't work, I believe that this morning message will help you, will inspire you to give marriage another chance. That's one. 
And then if you are preparing, if you are not married yet, it will help your preparation towards the marriage. And then if you are married and there are a little bit of storm here and there, it will also help you to, to be able to approach the issues that you are confronted with with a better understanding. Can I have a beautiful amen this morning? Yeah. So the term family of origin refers to the unit that cared for each and every one of us as a child. The people you had your family experiences with while growing up. Some people actually were raised by their parents and that's good. But majority of people or some other people were raised by either their aunt, their grandparents, depending on what your parents were doing by the time you were born. Some people, they were born and then they traveled. So they dropped them with their grandparents. Some people were raised by their uncle. Some other people were raised by family friends. I, I, I have a friend like that. Uh, our parents, both of them died on the same day in an accident. So as they were leaving the place of burial, there were four of them. So they distributed them or distributed them to various families to take good care of them because they were quite young. So they were separated from that. Um, in fact, I think the, the eldest then was eight. They were between eight and I can't remember the exact age, but they were quite young. So they just had to hand them over to family members on their way from burying their parents. So, um, some people were raised that way. Some people were raised uh, by siblings. Their parents were not there. Some people were raised by friends, family friends. Some people were raised, they were fostered. They don't even know their parents. So, whichever category, uh, the family of origin is not your, your core family. It's not your, uh, your, your maybe father, mother, and your siblings. It's the first social group you were exposed to. I was exposed to while growing up. I believe you had that understanding. So, the, the term is not to be confused with your biological family. A typical mother, father, and children. No. A biological family, sometimes they are there, but they might have little to do with your development if they were not raised by you. Can I have an amen? So, a biological family are people you are generally connected to. So, by extension, your cousins, your uncles, your aunties. So, if they didn't raise you, I'm not talking about this family of origin is different now. So, it's a concept. That we must all understand. So your family of origin is your first social group which has influenced your thought patterns, your behaviors, and lifestyle. So I believe we can get it now. So your family of origin, they have influenced your thought patterns, your behaviors, and then your lifestyle. This environment can either be healthy or toxic the family of origin environment those people who raise you up you can either have it good i mean i, I read i had the story of someone raised by his grandmother and it was very i mean he couldn't they couldn't afford anything but they usually discriminate against him when kids are playing, he doesn't have shoes back then. So he was sharing the story. But one thing that my grandmother had, he didn't, she didn't go to school, but she will always, each time I come back home crying, she will always say, my son, you will be great. She will always say, you will go to abroad. You go until you are tired. She will always speak words. She didn't go to school. She didn't have any about parenting but she she was raised she raised him with word of affirmation and it was just a matter of time he became a lawyer he traveled around the world and all that but he will always make reference to that because 
He had enough beating outside. He had enough putting down outside. But someone raised him to be a confident man. A confident man. Can I have an amen this morning? I just want to put this in proper perspective for us so that we can understand this. So, your family of origin is that first social group which influences your thought pattern, your behaviors, and your lifestyle. And I said that it can either be healthy or toxic. And for most people, that may be responsible for their trauma, their abuse triggers, the things that they have witnessed. Some family of origin are dysfunctional. I, I will explain myself. But so, that family unit in which you and I were raised in is what is termed the family of origin. Let's see how strong and impactful this. Boys raised in such family learn how to be fathers by the people watching over them. Why girls that are raised in such family learn to be mothers by those who raised them? So, whether yours was deliberate or accidental, what you and I copied from such family of origin has become our default setting for life. Whether good or bad. So, this is the thing. The concepts, this concept suggests, I mean, these are social studies. These are things, and I will show us from the scripture how we can also see the way this works. This concept suggests that if a man's response to his wife's criticism sometimes is to eat her, the tendency is high that he was raised in a home where domestic violence thrived. Without fail. And then, if a woman has the habit of talking and shouting back at her husband as a way of defense, it also suggests that that was the model offered to her while growing up. So this concept is so practical. The effects are real. And it operates silently until light, like we are doing this morning, is cast on such situations. Abraham lied about Sarah's status. That, that was his sister. Instead of wife, Isaac was there. So Isaac had to lie about his own wife later. He repeated the same thing. Rebecca lied and he had complications during her pregnancy. Tamar also did that. But the good news, Esau was a good king. And so he was in the lineage of Jesus, but he had a father who did evil. But he changed the narrative. And that's the whole essence of my message here this morning. Whatever narrative, as I'm talking this morning, that you are putting into shape, you are connecting the dot, we can change that narrative. That takes us to our test. We are seated. We have been raised together and we are seated with Christ far above. The building is quiet. I expected it so. So, 
So, the same thing, family of origin, takes us to what we also refer to as dysfunctional families. How does that work? It appears in varying dimension. It's simply defined as the multiple internal or external conflicts which affect the basic need of every family unit. If your dad is stingy, the tendency is that you have carried that anointing without knowing. If you have seen your mom ask your dad for money, and the man just goes. The tendency is that when your wife asks you for money, that's the way you go. It's are so strong that my dad wear his socks right leg first. So while I was growing up as a boy, that's where I start up to now. Unconsciously, I wear this one. If you wake up in homes where when people even say greeting, you respond with curses, that's probably the same parenting model. Your head is not correct. I mean, some people don't speak good words. Your head is not correct. You are, you are fool. You are, you are, you know, they just have all those, they roll it. And if you are from my town, one of the Southwest, your mouth is like razor blade. You can cut anything. Somebody just say, sit down. He said, can you one, you know, sitting down. You know, see, it's, it's the environment. If you are raised, I mean, one of our brothers shared this. He was raised in a certain part of this city. If you are raised in a certain part of this city, you can't be a dunce. People engage in street fight every day to get whatever they want. If you carry that into marriage, the tendency, your first response is to fight for everything. Dysfunctional. If you are raised in um, polygamous home, it may even be affecting your faith without you knowing because you suspect everybody has been after you. And it's the same thing. If you are raised in a church where uh, they see, they hear, they do all kinds of things, that's what will still, even though you are born again now, that is what is still involved in motivating your spiritual growth. Unless somebody says something, unless somebody sees something, you are not satisfied. This is how... That's your first, you know, auto-response. That's, that's your default setting. So, in most dysfunctional families, you see things like sibling rivalries. You see things like parent-child conflicts. You see things like domestic violence. You see things like sexual abuse. And you see it over time when people can manage it, physical or mental illness. Because the pressure is much. Sometimes you see single parenthood. One parent household. Even though the two parents may be there, you dare not walk up to the man or you dare not walk up to whoever. Some people will always struggle when it's time to pay school fees and house rent. Some of us, we grew up in such environment. You see alcohol use, drug use. As a matter of fact, in the study on alcohol, they said it's so bad that they have shown that they can trace where people are really addicted to alcohol. They can trace it to 10 generations. Some people is gambling. I'm not talking about this, your, this, Bet this like their bet, even though that's also bad. But some people they met their father like that. (laughs) 
And the only time he smiles at everybody is Saturday evening. The glasses is like that. You are talking to him, he's like that. Some people is addicted parents, just pressure, they are off. And so, in their own space now, if they also want to manage pressure, it's auto. Some people drink themselves to sleep. They pick it from that environment. Some people who are promiscuous, they also pick it. I used to have a friend. Their house, they don't lock the door. The last person we just, if he's, if he's still in his right sense. Nobody asks after you. So the house is free, entry and exit. You can bring whatever. I, was in, I thought it was freedom, really. Because my own house, they burn you well. No come house for. In fact, by 637, you will explain tire. If you are not home. By 8, you will be hearing voices of people inside. The gate is locked. And they're not born you now. Say so you wrote their money devotion for money. But their house is so, it was easy. It was, he influenced my life. Because through him, I learned to smoke. So that's how powerful these influences are. He's also a pastor today, so I have no regret. But the truth is that these are things that people are exposed to. And you know, if Jesus is at work in us, it should make that difference. One of our brothers was sharing his testimony that he went back to where he grew up and he was wondering, did I actually grow up in this household? He said, because the people he left many years ago, they are still there. There are some household, no matter what you go, you are working anywhere, you, you live in that family house. You live in the family house. So you marry, you leave. The wife leaves you, you marry another one, you bring. Dysfunctionalities in families. Some people are, have minor, but some people, they are deep rooted issues. So, for everyone who grew up, for example, in dysfunctional family, you might have faced concern since your childhood. And it's even affecting you as an adult. And the truth is that when such people get married, they think that their spouse has the solution. He doesn't, she doesn't. And that's the whole essence of this. Your spouse is also looking for solution. You are also looking for solution. Is solution, is solution. I mean, you get married at 30 or at 35, your spouse is 35, you are 32. That's 67 years of problems. Sleeping on the same bed. He doesn't have, she doesn't have the solution. And that's the whole essence of this message this morning. We must come into the awareness of it. And align ourselves with what Christ has done. Positionally, we are seated. But let me use you to preach. Who has most you among you? Come, 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 come. Stand there. Stand there. Stand there. Face them. So let three of them come. They want to sit. Oh, yeah. And then you resist them from coming. So that may stand as pride. And pride is the, is the thing. Oh yeah, go. You can't sit. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. You can't sit. Oh yeah, come now. You are not. You are not. You are preaching for me. Another person should come. So you just resist them back. So sometimes we are seated positionally with Christ, but there are things. resist us that covers our eyes and those are 
things. Sometimes it's money, even this money. Because we have, we have suffered, um, what is it called? Financial inadequacies while we are growing up. So little, little things. We resist, the devil that is not the devil, but that's, that's the one who resists us from walking in the fullness. God wants us to have healthy families. But sometimes these things are the very thing that resist us from that flow to come into us. We are seated in, with Christ. He's the head of our family. He has the virtue. He has the wisdom. He has the knowledge. He has the understanding that we need to run our home. But these are the natural things that resist us from enjoying the fullness of what God has in store for us. Please go back. Thank you, sir. So for us who grew up in dysfunctional family, you find out that most of the time it's conflict. 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 My uncle just died. He left with us 36 children. But we discovered that he sold all the land. And we can't see it in his life while he was alive. He doesn't have a living wife by the time he was dying. So he was running after small, small girls. Uh, you open your mouth. That's why my whole life. I, you, see, you have to trace this thing very well. And say to yourself, it stops with me. It doesn't cross over. It stops with me. I am seated with Christ. So my focus, my attention is. In every family, you have all these people. Dysfunctional family. There's one auntie of us. She's dead. If there is any family meeting, you know that you will, all of you will fight by the time you are leaving that family because she will never agree. She doesn't agree for any. In fact, I, that will agree. That will agree. I think I learned it through her action. You can organize something. Immediately she walks in, she scatters it. And that person, you know that, obviously, I don't have to. Is she married? No. She has three kids from three different men. We don't know the husband or the father of those children. You dare not ask. These things are not funny, but eh, Christians, we are the ones who take things with levity. These are the reality of life. So you trace yours. Paradventure as I speak this morning. See, you can't do... Eh, I will not grieve for you. I will not grieve for you. Ah, then you will not grieve for me. That's why the other day, I saw your mother not grieve for your father. Me too. Ah, I know we'll grieve for you. Ah, you won't make me like Mumu like your father. Those are conversations behind closed doors. No, there is no need to fight. Just recognize where you are. So, such children in dysfunctional family, they process things differently. So some may feel lonely, some will develop low self-esteem and self-worth, some might experience physical or mental health problems, some might just adopt coping mechanisms that people are not even aware of, some of those mechanisms are unhealthy, some kids smoke, their parents don't know, they drink, their parents don't know, uh, so they just develop survival mechanisms and they are looking for the day of escape, which is the day of marriage. But you know that that is problem raised to power many when they leave home. So let's go to good news. Why did God create marriage? Why did he? We need to answer that question. Why did God create marriage? Why did he? Why did he? You know, I said last week that is in the last five decades that things went haywire. There are recent debates and decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court about LGBTQIS. So, which purposely my interpretation trigger the root and the purpose of marriage. I'm going somewhere this morning. 
But the question is, how can we really know the meaning of marriage if we don't refer to the creator of marriage? The government and courts are choosing an increasing secular approach to this question. The truth is that, as America it is, 96.9% of the population believe that there is God. It's another thing that they believe the God of the Bible, but they just believe. So, why did God create marriage? Number one, it doesn't matter what people say today. Number one reason is for companionship. So if you are not married, you are looking to get married, it's for companionship. If you are married and you are lonely, you need to reconnect yourself back to your spouse. It's for companionship. Genesis 2.18 talks about the first union. Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. You know, I've done over this week, I did a, quite a whole lot of research. And I realized something, which, I, I, if I can touch some of those things today, because I found them online usually at medical sites. But I also find it that they've been doing their research since 1928, the LGBTQ thing, about the sexuality of man. So you find that most of the things that you find is that according to LGBTQ Resource Center, these are the lists of sexuality. These are the least. So it's not according to the Bible. And a lot of Christians believe that they are homosexual, uh, asexual, all these things that is now being listed for us. No. 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 I, I, if I can go through some of the lists, I will. They are list of confusion. How can I think I'm a man in the morning and in the afternoon I think maybe I'm a woman? And in the evening, I don't even know which one I am. That's confusion. That's confusion. It's not God's intention. He created marriage for companionship. When Adam was without a wife, he was alone. But he was not lonely. So, without your spouse, you will be lonely. You will be sad. You will be pitiful. You will be like little puppy. So God in the wisdom made a helper. A helper means ideal partner who was just right for him. You know, those some of us who are married, maybe that mind shift will help us to work on our marriage better. The word translated helper is the word exar. E Z he am. In original Hebrew, it means God's help made available to meet a need in your life. God's help. God's help. God's help. So, the idea of a helper means you are meeting each other's need for companionship, for synergy, for cooperation. And it can be on many levels, whether relational, socially, emotionally, financially, parentally, intellectually, recreationally. That person is your helper. You hear people say, my better half. You hear people say, my completer. You see, there is just that mind shift. Marriage is for companionship. That's one. Secondly, marriage is for sexual fulfillment. Sexual fulfillment. Marriage is meant to be the fulfillment and release of our sex drive. In 1 Corinthians 7 verses 8 and 9, it says, So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it is better to stay unmarried just as I am, but if they cannot control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. 
it is better to marry than to born with lust. Paul wasn't saying marriage is bad. But he said he had found it a fool to be single so that he can focus on his own ministry. And if you don't have such a ministry, it is better to marry than to born. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, how powerful this sex is from the good word translation. He said, don't withdraw yourself from each other unless you agree to do so for a set time to devote yourself to prayer. Then you should get back together so that Satan doesn't use your lack of self-control to tempt you. Let me read something to you. I may not be able to go into... So, there is a gender crisis in our world. So, there is the concept that is being promoted by humanists and all these people in the LGBTQ plus or whatever, minus or addition or divide, division. Gender identity is how a person feels and who they know themselves to be when, to, when it comes to the agenda. So I want you to look at the word feel. Feel. Feelings. Feel. I feel like marrying to a dog. That's a selfish man. Feel. Feel. BR is feeling in prison now. Feel. So, you see, what is being promoted now is that there are more than two genders. I, 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 saw, I saw something in the B2 research this. The person said in 2003, he was filling a form. So, gender, only two colors, male and female. But in 2023, there are about 50 things ahead of him he was trying to pick. And I am fat, I am, I am fat, but not sure I am a male. I am fat, but not sure I am a teenager. Hey. So, they have introduced gender identity, including male, female, transgender, gender neutral, non-binary, agenda, pro, per gender, uh, gender qua, two-spirit, third gender, all. Ah, oh, nah. See, it's not, it's not because we are believers, but because, you see, Everybody is now being made to accept this as a way of life. No. As a matter of fact, my research, what it has helped me, they said don't use the word hmm, homosexual anymore because it's an archaic word. So I remember when they say it's an archaic word. So I now go back that that word was used in Genesis. It was also used in Romans 1. So use the word gay. They said because that's an ancient, uh, uh, um, is an ancient word. Homosexuality is an ancient word. It's an archaic word. And people who are in the, in the new world don't live in that old world. How can I, how can I be training my child that in the morning you are Caroline, in the afternoon, you are Peter. In the evening. How can I do that? How can I do that to the mind of a young person? And one of the research that I found. So they target all those young people. They, they, they strat, they've, they've given the strategy that every child will come into that awareness from age three. See, we are sleeping now. And you see, we are not competing. All I'm asking of you this morning, just understand the purpose of God for marriage and make up your mind to build a model home. That's it. Be the light in this darkness. That's all I'm asking for. I'm not doing advocacy. The advocacy is build a healthy family. 
They can, they've been signing it since 1920 something. So it's not new. So they said gender can be complex and people must now define themselves in new and different ways to gain deeper understanding of their identities. They said, in fact, they are discovering it. That's why they have added plus to it. Are there seven genders? They said no. Conversation with real people uh, observe seven unique gender, female, male, intersex, trans, non-conforming, personal, eunuch. So, uh, pronouns can be the first person singular, hi, me, or pura, we, us, or second person singular, you, and the third person singular, he, she, he, him, they, them, they, here, they, them, he, him, his or she, has or has. So, how many genders do we have today? Gender isn't about someone's anatomy. It is who they know themselves to be. Yeah, it's there. You can check it. Go and check it. So, non-binary, agenda, per gender, gender qua, two-spirit, third gender, so, beside male and female, there are 72 other genders as we speak this morning. See, I don't have a problem because Romans 1 has given me understanding. He said, because they did not acknowledge God, God, they've been handed over to reprobate mind. They can devise an evil. But like I'm saying to you this morning, let us make our mind to build healthy families. Let's not even allow the things that we have been exposed to to be the very hindrance why we will not build healthy families. So sexual fulfillment, please, those who are married, the scripture affirms that sex is between a husband and a wife and never to be used as a tool of negotiation. Number three reason why God created marriage. Reproduction. Reproduction. I saw a video in the course of this week. It's Lagos. So the police were the one, I think, who, who caught that guy. Had a wig, had everything. Had makeup. I don't know where they caught him. So they asked him to remove so what he has done underneath his dress, he pierces his nipples, so he looks pointed in the cloth. And so he hid his penis up till that place. Very horrible thing. So it's not BR alone. There are many in our society now. We are cannot give back to a child. Even when you do, you can only do surrogate. How water enter coconut? God has not shown man. Uh, that reproduction is between a man and a woman. A man was released the seed, a woman was received the seed. I know they do all those transplanting and all that in all those other places. But go and look at the men who carry the pregnancy. What is that percentage? Number four, reason why God created marriage. Raising godly children. Raising godly children. Raising God. So, in Deuteronomy 11, verses 18 to 21, look at the command that God gave his own people. I'm not bothered about the community. I mean, it's a larger community. They have money. They are doing their advocacy. They are pushing it hard on our faces. It's showing up in our movies. It's showing up in our thing. But look at what God says to you and I. Deuteronomy 11, 18 to 21. He says, so commit yourself all at to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead. As reminders, teach them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are on the road, when you are going to bed, when you are getting up. 
write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gate so that as long as the sky remains above the heart, you and your children may flourish in the land swore to give to your father. I know the whole noise about inclusion, about uh, exclusion, whatever it is. See, raising godly children is one of the responsibilities we have. I know the voice of feminism. I mean, it's a, but I think it's been taken to extremes. A child will be more emotionally stable if the two parents are present. Number five, reason why God created marriage. To demonstrate the Christ symbolic marriage eh, as his bride, to his bride, that is the church. You know that word in Ephesians 5, 22 to 33? Hmm? Marriage is made to reflect the wonderful love relationship between Jesus and his church. So to demonstrate that relationship, Christ's symbolic marriage to his bride, the church. That's why he created it. God is not going to come and marry here. No, we are his extension. We are the one to show the world what healthy marriages should look like. What parenting godly way should look like. We are the one. Number six, which is the last point for today. To serve as the busy building block for the society. To serve, that's the reason, as a busy building block of the society. See, if you look at the scripture, the children of Israel, they come, they were protected by families during the Exodus. In the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem, it was done section by section by families, according to Nehemiah. People were willing to fight and protect for the, their families. Jesus was raised in a family. It's not coincidence. People who don't even have regular family, once they are converted, they are converted into the family of God. So God knows when we build families, what it stands to impact the larger society. Some of us who grew outside Lagos, eh? I, I, I keep sharing this story over and over again because it's one of the things that we have lost. So you are walking on a street, eh? And you are doing like that. And you are passing the elders. Somebody will call you. And say, ah, are you wearing goggles? <laughs> and the next thing they will ask you, oh, Montagne. Whose son are you or whose daughter are you? And God help you that your parents have good name in the society. You will hear, go, 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 Then go ahead of me. I'm coming to your house. You beg. Don't come because it's, you know what is awaiting you. The glory of that latter house. <laughs> because that's the building block. So our parents, eh? some of us, we miss jam by three marks. Your dad told you, go and rewrite it. Say, I can't beg. We don't beg. Because there's just something. In my neighborhood, they know those who still. Not deep present neighborhood, though, because I don't even know my neighbors. <laughs> Or just are the things. It's a building block. If, if this is our house and all the children, all of, we are playing football, we are making noise, they know that your parents are not home. They just know. So somebody technically is watching over that household. 
And if something goes wrong, they are watching you. They know who is the offender. They call you and give you. And then you gentle because you know that they're likely going to report you to your parents. So it's a building block. The family. I say it and I say it again. In our city, the presence of area boys and girls is a, is a proof that there are area fathers and mothers. 